Good morning, everyone. Welcome to COGX. Lovely to see you all here bright and early for our AI narratives extravaganza which, with which we're going to open this stage. Uh, my name is Dr. Sarah Dillon. I'm a senior research fellow at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence at the University of Cambridge, which will be hereafter known as CFI because that's far too many words to say in a row repeatedly. Um, right. Meet Norman, the psychopath AI that's here to teach us a lesson. Creator of destroy human robots wants civil rights for androids. Doomsday AI will cause a nuclear war by 2040 that could destroy humanity and there may be no way to prevent it. That one was the Daily Mail. The other two were from The Independent. These are just a few of the headlines that have been knocking around the British press in the last few weeks about AI and they are not uncommon. It's also no coincidence that these kind of headlines are usually accompanied by everybody's favorite killer robot, the Terminator. Um, the stories that have been told about AI have determined how it's being received even before the technology was actually created. This is a very curious situation, but if AI is going to be trusted, if it's going to be understood, and if it's going to have benefit for all, we need to stop the Terminator chat. And we're here this morning to figure out quite how to do that. So uh, we're going to have a keynote followed by a panel. The keynote will be two of my colleagues from CFI, Dr. Kanta Dihal and Dr. Stephen Cave, who are going to introduce our project, which is a collaboration with the Royal Society called AI Narratives. And after that talk, we will draw together panelists from the media, from uh, science policy and from economics to discuss where we might go from here. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Cave and Dr. Kanta Dihal. Thank you very much, Sarah. So we're going to talk about our fears around AI and how to mitigate them, and we'll do so by starting with a little story. The 17th century French philosopher René Descartes was one of the most influential advocates of the view that living things were really just machines. This was a radical idea at the time. Contrary to thousands of years of thinking, he argued that plants and animals didn't need any kind of magical spirit to animate them, but were more like automata, so clever clockwork toys. It's also well known that Descartes was very fond of actual automata. He wasn't only inspired by them in his philosophy, but he was fascinated by them as physical objects. And it's said that he carried some automata about with him on his travels and would use him to demonstrate the plausibility of his mechanical view of life by showing what clever things these machines could do. It is slightly well, less well known that Descartes had an illegitimate daughter. Francine, she was born to a Dutch servant girl in 1635. And Descartes seems to have been very fond of both mother and daughter and lived with them despite the social impropriety. But just as Descartes was making plans to take Francine back to France to be educated, she died at the age of five from scarlet fever. And that is where the more credible stories end. But it's not the end of all versions. According to some reports, Descartes was entirely unable to accept the loss of Francine. He was so devastated that he had her resurrected in the form of an automaton. He had built a robot daughter, indistinguishable from the original, able even to walk and talk. And according to these stories, Dickert and his robot daughter were inseparable. He slept with her encased in a casket at his side. In 1649, Queen Christina invited him to Sweden, and so he naturally took Francine on board the ship with him. But, as the journey went on, the captain and crew were increasingly suspicious of that mysterious trunk in the philosopher's cabin and the voices they heard when he was supposed to be alone. They wondered if there wasn't some dark magic at work that was responsible for the bad weather they'd been having. So, while Descartes was sleeping, they broke in and opened the casket. And to their horror, the mechanical Francine sat up and started talking to them. The crew, convinced that this unnatural object was the source of their bad luck, dragged Francine out, smashed the robot, and threw her into the sea. And Descartes himself died a few months later. 
Now, this is far from the earliest story about an artificial person, and such stories go back to at least a thousand years BC, and we'll show you a few examples in a bit. But this story in particular quite neatly encompasses some of the hopes and the fears that we have associated with intelligent machines for, um, before and since. For Descartes, at least in the story, the automaton offered him the power of creation, the power to have his desires fulfilled, to have his beloved Francine back. It gave him the ability to overcome natural boundaries, including the greatest boundary of all, that between life and death. But then we have the reaction of the ship's crew. When they open the casket, they see a monster, a creature that, because it violates natural boundaries, is terrifying and sinister. They see something that is so unnatural that it's upsetting the natural order around them, and so it must be destroyed. Now, of course, technology has always aroused in us such hopes and fears, but AI is special. It isn't a mere tool like other technologies. Its promise is that it will acquire qualities that are definitively human, such as mind, intelligence, and autonomy. And so, in our imagination, AI tips from being a mere tool into the realm of gods and monsters. So we've been examining these imaginings in our AI narratives project that Sarah mentioned, based at CFI at the University of Cambridge, and with our partners at the Royal Society in London. And the project set out with a few specific goals. First of all, to understand the hopes and fears and other factors that shape how we perceive AI. But also to understand the complex relationship between those emotions and imaginings on the one hand and the actual technology on the other. And the arrow of causation here runs both ways. The imaginings both inspire and guide the development of the technology, and at the same time, strive to reflect it. But we are particularly interested in those moments when that relationship between the imaginings and the reality of the technology breaks down. So this breakdown could be that we are distracted from the real problems of AI by fantasies of killer robots, for example. Or it could be that whole sectors of society are put off from entering the field because it's framed in a way that seems not to reflect their values or their interests. And we hope in our project that by specifying and evidencing these limitations in the way we talk about and think about AI, we can begin to inspire change. Not to one right way of thinking about AI, but hopefully to a much richer and more diverse way, range of ways of thinking. Now we'll come back to those limitations in a moment, and also in the panel after this talk and in the breakout group after that. But first it might be useful to give a brief overview of how we see the landscape of narratives around AI has developed. So at first it seems to us that our imaginings about AI were mostly hopeful, such as fantasies of trusty mechanical helpers. But as over centuries the technology has increased in power, these hopes began to tip into fears. And we argue that the fears are inherent in the way we conceive of autonomous machines. Now, the oldest known story of something like AI can be found in Homer's Iliad, dating back to roughly the 8th century BC. And made by Hephaestus, the god of smithing, the machines were, and I quote from the Iliad, handmaidens wrought of gold in the semblance of living maids. In them is understanding in their hearts, and in them speech and strength, and they know cunning handiwork. So they appear as faithful servants of their crippled master. And other legends attributed other technological wonders to Hephaestus, such as Talos, the great bronze automaton that patrolled the shores of Crete, throwing stones at pirates and invaders, so a kind of proto-killer robot, if you like. And in these stories, the intelligent machines represent straightforward hopes, such as for the faithful, loyal servant or for the soldier who never tires. But with the declining influence of Greece, the Latin Christian West entered a long period, perhaps a thousand years, in which the skills of automaton making were lost, and with them also the hopes. And until the late 13th century, the mechanical arts were preserved mostly in the Islamic and Byzantine worlds, and so they were associated in the West with foreignness and treated with awe, but also suspicion. 
And then when intelligent machines were eventually rehabilitated in the Latin Christian West, it was first in the form of these kind of loyal retainers that we saw a moment ago. But soon thereafter came hints of darker themes that we still see today. So a series of great scholars, for example, like Roger Bacon and Robert Gossetest, were rumored to have created bronze heads that could answer any questions, or kind of proto-Siri. But these stories always end badly, with mishaps or destruction of the oracle, sometimes even the creator. And the moral seems to be that the creation of AI is an act of Promethean hubris, that such semi-divine power should not belong to mortals. Presaging the story of Frankenstein, these stories show that the exercise of such power ends in destruction either of the artifact or the maker or both. And this whiff of hubris has never left the AI project. But other themes have also come to the fore as the technology itself has developed. In the second half of the 17th century, through to the early 19th century, we saw the heyday of automaton making in Europe. And in this period, master craftsmen built astonishing marvels of art imitating life, such as Jacques de Vaucanson's duck that would appear to eat and drink and even defecate. And even though they were neither genuinely intelligent nor autonomous, these machines suggested that life like androids might be within reach. And with this came new fears of transgression and deception. So for example, in E.T.A. Hoffman's famous short story from 1816, The Sandman, the protagonist Nathaniel is bewitched by the beauty of a maiden called Olympia. And when, after much wooing, he finds out that actually she's an automaton, he's driven to insanity and suicide. But it wasn't until the 20th century that the imaginative resonance of intelligent machines really reached its fullest. That was, of course, a time of enormous upheaval, of rapid industrialization, disrupting the old ways of life, the rhythms of the countryside being replaced by the rhythms of the production line. It was a time of revolution and murderous mechanized warfare. And it was against this backdrop that the term robot was born. In Karel Chapek's 1920 play, RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots. And famously, in the very work in which the term robot was coined, they rebel against their creators and destroy them. So when we survey the range of hopes and fears for AI that have appeared throughout history and are prevalent today, we can pick out four themes. And each theme is a kind of dichotomy of a hope and a fear. You could see them as visions of unstable utopias continually threatening to tip into dystopia. So the first duality of hope and fear that we'd like to explore concerns work. We could describe it as ease versus obsolescence. We heard earlier about the golden handmaidens of Hephaestus, and those gods, uh, and, and that god made these thinking, speaking robots to help him in his workshop. So in the oldest story of AI that we have, it plays the role of the servant. And this is a recurring theme since, both in science fiction and in sober predictions of the future. AI is supposed to offer us a life of luxury and ease, but without the complex social and psychological pressure of having human servants. A world in which each of us gets to be boss. But at the same time, as we dream of being free from work, we are terrified of being put out of work. Work provides us with an income, of course, but also with a role in society, with status and standing, with a purpose and pride. However truck drivers may sometimes feel about their jobs, they're surely not dreaming of the day when driverless vehicles do their work for them. Of course, as technology advances, society adapts and eventually creates new jobs. But it's understandable that we worry about what we'll do when AI does everything better. The second duality concerns power. The story of the human race is war, said Sir Winston Churchill. You might think his view pessimistic, but few students of human nature would deny that the pursuit of dominance runs deep in us. So, unsurprisingly, when apes like us start to make clever machines, it's at least partly to further our hopes of dominating others. As we saw with uh, the bronze giant Talos, stories of what we now call autonomous weapons are ancient. 
and in modern times, we should remember that much of the funding for AI research comes directly from the military. So it's easy to imagine how the hope of acquiring dominance turns into its flip side, the fear of being dominated. And in particular, we don't just fear losing control of AI as a tool, so the, the sorcerer's apprentice kind of story, but also we fear that AIs will acquire minds of their own, that they will turn from mere tools into agents, and from deus ex machina into diabolus ex machina, like this one you've all been waiting for. The persistence of the robot rebellion theme reveals the paradox at the heart of our relationship with intelligent machines. We want to create clever tools that can do everything we can and more, including to be the perfect soldier. And for these tools to fulfill our hopes, we must give them attributes like intellect, autonomy, and agency. In other words, minds of their own. But it's not hard to see the tension in the idea of creating beings that are superhuman in capacity, but subhuman in status. Our fears of HAL and Skynet show that we recognize the deep paradox in our dream of creating powerful independent minds that are at the same time enslaved to us. The third dualism we could describe as gratification versus alienation, because just as AI promises to be the perfect servant without the complications of human social hierarchy, so it promises to automate and therefore uncomplicate the fulfillment of every desire. It could be the perfect friend, always ready to listen, never demanding anything in return. And so in our imaginings of AI, we find many of those examples from uh, Robbie, uh, the robot in Isaac Asimov's very first iRobot story, uh, to Scarlett Johansson's voice in the recent film, Her. And of course, AI could be the perfect lover, or as in this example, in Fritz Lang's Metropolis, it could, uh, or in the story of Descartes' daughter, it could replace a deceased loved one. But the flip side to the idea of human-AI relationships is that while some may embrace AI becoming an intimate part of our lives, others may reject the idea of something so unnatural, even monstrous, invading our homes. And in robotics, the term uncanny valley describes that revulsion that people feel when faced with a replica that is almost human, but not quite. It seems to conjure in us a deep and ancient fear of the doppelganger or the changeling, the demon child. And that fear is based on AI being almost but not quite human. But there are also fears regarding AI being better than humans. If we all have our desires fulfilled by AIs, then we will have become redundant to each other. We might therefore not only become obsolete in the workplace, but even in our own homes and in our own relationships. And finally, we want to explore a duality we might call immortality versus inhumanity. The pursuit of health and longevity is one of our most basic drives for obvious reasons. It's the, the precondition of almost anything else you might want to do. So naturally, we've always used technology in order to achieve these goals, in order to extend our lives as much as possible. And it's no surprise that one of the great hopes for AI is therefore to do just this, to offer us better diagnoses and personalized medicine and so on. But some of the most ardent advocates of AI's potential suggest it will make us entirely immune to aging and disease, that we can become, through AI, something like medical immortals. But even this isn't real immortality, is it? It means we're still dependent upon these rather messy and unreliable bodies. So some advocates go even further still and believe that we might be able to transcend this body altogether. Now, this is, of course, an ancient dream, and just as medieval monks might have desired to leave their corrupt and sinful bodies behind in order to rise as pure spirits into the heaven, so today, techno-utopians dream of leaving their weak and feeble bodies behind in order to upload themselves into cyberspace. But this hope has a flip side, too. The fear of losing humanity. And in the original Star Wars films, Darth Vader is given new life, but at a cost. As Obi-Wan Kenobi says, he's more machine now than man, twisted and evil. And philosophers and science fiction writers have long speculated about what will be left once we've turned ourselves into pure data and uploaded ourselves onto server farms in Arizona. 
Now, these four dichotomies that we've just sketched reveal our complex relationship, our complex responses to AI. Yet many of these arise from conceptions that bear little reality to the actual AI technology. These hopes and fears seem to have their own momentum completely independent of real-world algorithms. And on the one hand, we have to acknowledge these powerful emotional responses that we have to AI. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge that their source is not modern machine learning. And we should beware that, they don't, that these hopes and fears don't lead us to dismiss technologies that might, in fact, be enormously beneficial, or at the same time, dismiss real concerns that just don't fit into that kind of schema. Now, one thing that you hopefully will have noticed in this whistle-stop tour of AI narratives that Cantor and I have just given you is that all of our examples are from the Western narrative tradition. And especially in the 20th century, these are the narratives that have influenced the researchers of Silicon Valley, who are mostly white men. They were written largely by science fiction authors who come from the same demographic, i.e. white men. And this is reflected in the way in which we see humanoid robots, for example. And the fact that they are gendered usually, that they have distinct ethnicities, means that the audience is responding to them with certain stereotypical reactions. So not only do many of the hopes and fears we have for AI bear little relation to the actual technology, but they're also specific to one cultural and demographic group. And that's why we're now expanding our AI narratives project and taking it globally. And we've recently partnered with uh, Professor Toshi Takahashi from Waseda University in Japan. And she's given us a fabulous example of cultural differences in AI narratives. So just look here at the way uh, Big Hero 6 was advertised in the US versus how it was advertised in Japan. And we see two very different ideas of what AI can or should be. Now, given the cultural specificity of our fears, one way of mitigating them might be to look at how narratives from other cultural trad traditions offer us new imaginative resources that can help us to build a better, more realistic understanding of AI. And that's what the next panel will be looking at. So we're now going to hand over to our colleague, Dr. Sarah Dillon, who will be discussing current narratives of AI, why they matter, and how we might change them. Thank you very much. Thank you.